Hey there, Danny Grimes coming to you from Southwest Florida for another edition of Scripts and Role Plays in the C19 world. Well, how about in a world where we're having a goat market? We've got Jeff Pennington who's going to be a co-host. We've got Sunny watching the chat. She's my director of growth, and I appreciate you guys being on. James started off by asking a great question about, you know, how can buyers, how can agents, and how can buyers win in this uber competitive market when basically buyers are waving all kinds of things. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. I want to go ahead because I want to share some detail with you guys, some data, which is a little bit unusual for me. I'm going to share a screen. So I trust you have a decent monitor. You might be on your phone. I don't really know. Let me go to share a screen here for a second. And uh, see if it comes up. There we go. So here we are, April 13th already. I want to start by sharing something I learned, and it goes down the alley. You asked just a minute ago there, James, about how we can prepare sellers so we can prepare buyers better. I think the market's crazy. It's driving everybody crazy. And I think it's kind of uh, kind of an, a weird situation, Jeff, that we're in a market that is the greatest market of all time. And you think basically this is the kind of market agents dream about, right? Yet there's a lot of agents that are having a lot more frustrations now. And there's, there's agents out there that aren't getting their fill of business. Why do you think that is in a market that is like the greatest of all time? There's such a small amount of inventory that unless you have a system in place to get listings, um, you have limited control over your destiny. Well, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. In fact, I had this thought and you helped me crystallize it just now. That's kind of how my mind works, like a sparkler, right? Um, what a, how about a reverse referral? I had somebody basically send me a referral the other day, and we appreciate referrals, so this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, where is the, if they send me a buyer referral, I'm going to charge them. How about that? For If they send me a seller referral, I don't care what, I'll give them a huge fee. However, we all have all the buyers we want. Inventory is the challenge. So I think there's some things that we can do to increase our effectiveness, to increase our customer relationships and the service we give, and to increase our business. Now, this is a small group today. We generally have a small group, and I want to share with you what I learned on my last listing appointment. Now, I'm, going to, I'm going to share this with you. Please don't tell anyone. This is really the first solo appointment I've gone and accompanied my agents before, shadowed them, mentored them, etc. But because of one situation or another, um, my daughter was not able to do this and it's in my daughter's territory. She asked me to go on the appointment. I was worried, right? I mean, I talk to you guys all the time. I'm supposed to be this great script master, yet I had to go and actually put my skills and my scripts to work. And on top of that, I'd never met the seller before and they were already interviewing. Uh, they were going to interview three agents. That's what I knew going in. So I'm going to share some things that I learned on this appointment, if that's okay. So one of the things I've learned, and I ended up getting a listing, or I probably would have had uh, Jeff or Sunday run the class, or maybe James, whatever. Uh, however, I did get the listing. One of the things I've learned is I, I'm using, I'm borrowing a term from Zig Ziglar called stinking thinking, right? And I'm going to call that the CMA rut. Now, James, this kind of goes back to a question you were asking here in Cal uh, Phoenix. And I know you basically are part of a group that has an office in California where everything's seven figures, right? And I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share a couple of screenshots with you about from our MLS about how other agents are looking at the market and how they they are probably hurting themselves. I'm gonna make sure you're not falling into the same trap. Now I understand this could be small if you're looking on the phone. That's why I'm screen sharing. I know basically what happened because when, when, um, when the, I heard, a, heard back from the seller that he elected to go with me, I uh, went through the paperwork and I used the Columbo question. Oh, but by the way, you know, you interviewed some agents. What made you select me? So he gave me some feedback and I'll share that with you. So let's look at a couple of different things. This is an MLS printout, kind of dumbed down a little. I took the addresses out because it doesn't really matter. And this is kind of what I look at when it comes to valuations. I just do a one line comparison. I'm in a, in a rather homogeneous neighborhood here. This is our farm area. This happened to be a little neighborhood inside a master plan community uh, of Villa Homes. Okay, so it's not like mid-century 
uh, eclectic type neighborhood with a lot of differences. The lots are the same size. There's some premium lots on the water, blah, blah, blah. Some may have a pool, et cetera. So let me break it down for you just a little bit. The subject property was uh, in the 1300 square foot range. So here I've highlighted the square footage and you can see basically it's, it's ordered by square footage and the list price. So if you just start at the top, you can see the first one is 212, 239, 209, 224. And then they start to get a little higher into the bigger homes. <clears throat> so that's kind of one of the first things you look at obviously now. One thing I'll say now, just to make sure I say it, I'll probably say it again to repeat it, is this. Jeff, I don't know if you guys do it in your market or not. I was on a role play with another market center somewhere else. And um, in fact, the seller was a builder and he kept talking to me and price per square foot. Do you, got, do you see that where you are in Phoenix uh, when, you're, when you're dealing in the retail uh, market, not the builder market, Jeff? Uh, uh, um I, we don't we don't see that a lot in the retail market. I mean, some people will use it as part of the part of the CMA, but it's not a number that people talk about a lot. Um, I'm in DC in the DC market. Oh, you're you're in DC. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I was talking to Northern yeah, you're DC. That's right. I was talking to James. He's he's in oh James. James yeah, James. Well, a lot of the we look at it that way, the CMA, but a lot of the appraisers aren't even considering that. I had one lady who I I brought all the details over to her in the CMA and she goes, Oh, you realtors, you always use price per square foot. We don't, we don't go by that. That's not how we appraise. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, I know it's a little bit different regional. Let me just give you my blink on this. I think, I think generally it, the way I evaluate the markets price per square foot is a very slippery uh, figure, particularly like in, if you're in a subdivision where you have a homogeneous rather builder and they got models A, B, C, D, and E, and you got one stories and two stories, what happens is there's a big variation of price per square foot from a two story or the larger the home versus a smaller the home. So you could have a variance, for example, you could have a home at $155 a square foot and another one basically at 180 or $200 a square foot. And you really can't average it to come up with an effective number. So one thing that I teach in my market here is basically I look at price point. I think, and I call it the Walmart method of pricing. You know, they have the falling prices as $4.89 or something like that, right? So the first thing I did was look at the, the, the square footage of the homes, look at the price point to see kind of what pond they were selling in. Now I'm gonna go through a couple of these different slides. Now there's, there is basically the group of uh, homes that were in the same price, uh, same size range as the subject property. And you can see, and I'm gonna show you one more thing. I think it's the next slide. The next thing I want you to know here is this. This is a snapshot of what's going on in that neighborhood. This is very similar to what many markets in your market, maybe you'd be doing the same thing. What is missing in that, in that column, you guys? What don't you see? <laughs> There are no actives. Does that, does that sound familiar to a lot of different markets out there? So everything is pending or sold. So when you look at it, I mean, obviously when you're gonna go in and meet with a seller, that is something you'll wanna know. Now going back to this slide, you can see basically, I've got the pending dates, the next column over, there was a couple of things that were pending in March, which is very significant. I mean, that's this year. What's significant about that, you guys, is many times you guys are looking at a CMA compared to market analysis and you're going back six months. I, I, you can do that to get a frame of reference. However, I think basically if you go back six months, five months, four months, those numbers can be way different than, the, than going back one month, two months, or three months. Are you guys in agreement with that? We're seeing a major uh, upward pressure on price faster than we did six months ago. Are you guys seeing that Jeff in your market? Yeah, we, uh, completely. The, um, you know, the old, the old uh, solds are not really a good indication of current value whatsoever. So what do you do? What do you guys do when basically maybe there's no, maybe there's no current uh, solds because the inventory has been low and you only have older solds. What, what do you guys do? Anyone can speak up. I know that James and, um, and Jeff have been talking, but anyone can speak up here. What do you do next if they're if you're having a hard time finding a data point to go on the market? 
can you look at what percentage a month it's going up and, and add 1% a month? You could add 6% to something that was six months ago sold. Okay, so so what you're doing is uh, you, you're adding a factor, uh, an appreciation factor to a past sale, right? Correct. And, and what market is it, Reagan? Reagan? Reagan. Yeah, Reagan, what market are you in? Greensboro, North Carolina. So would 6% 6, 6 be appropriate? Yes. Okay, that, that's one way, awesome. Who uses another method? What else could you be looking at? We usually ask the sellers what they want. What are you looking to get for your home? All right, well, all right. So Christina, I love that answer. So just hang with me. Are you the agent, I'm the seller. Well, uh, well, I thought you were the expert. Aren't you gonna tell me? <laughs> well, we have historical data that we can reference, uh, but the market is moving so quickly right now that it's really hard for me to say that if we price it at three months or six months ago's price, that you're going to be getting top dollar. So I'm sure that you have a number in mind that you're looking to get for your property. Let me know what that is, and we can explore that and see if it's realistic in this market. Well, I'll give you a number if you give me one first. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Uh, well, according to the comps, uh, your, your property is a two-bedroom, two-bath, 1,300-square-foot home. Uh, in, that, in that price range in this list that we have put together, it could go anywhere from two hundred dollars to $250,000. Is, is that price range somewhere that you were thinking in your mind you would like to get for your home? Now, let's, Christina, you're, you're a trooper. You are a trooper. Thanks for coming on. I know that you didn't think I was going to do that for you. However, so can we, can we discuss that little discussion just for a moment? Absolutely. Okay. So again, there's more than one way to play anything, chess. Okay. Chess match. One of the things you were doing great, you were doing awesome. <laughs> you know, from my technique, do you know where she probably stepped off the line a little bit? Anyone want to volunteer that have been on, on these calls with me before? I gave a price, any price at all. And you've always told us to let them set the price. Why did you do that? I was pressing you. I was being ornery. I was, I was saying, you know, look, you know, I'll show you my hand. You show me yours. Okay. And you and so you, you kind of fell for it. So again, I believe, and in fact, I just did a, my TV spot on it. And I'd really recommend, uh, no, I actually wrote an article for Real Trends. I don't know when it's going to come out uh, on setting expectations and not prices. So Christina, let's just do this role play in reverse. Okay. And you're asking me the same question. Well, I'll tell you what, that's why I have you here. I'll share my price. You share um, yours first. And so let's just assume you said that. Okay. One more thing, you guys, and this is worth writing down. Share what you know. Don't share what you guess. So Christina, uh, here's what I do know. Where the market has, where the fish were biting, where the past sales were, notice I didn't say comps, uh, they were somewhere in the 350 to 379 range. These are a couple of months old. And most likely based on the direction of the market, the, the next buyer is gonna be somewhere above that. What did you have in mind? Well, Denny, I know I want to buy a much nicer home, so I'd like to get the most money I possibly could. Um, are we willing to, do you suggest we go with the higher end of what the comps were at 375 and see if we can generate interest and get a bidding war going? Or would you suggest we just test the market and throw it out there at four or four and a quarter? Well, which one, which one feels right to you? I know that my neighbors have been telling me that they have kids that have been trying to get homes and every time they make an offer, they're going above asking and getting outbid. So maybe we could try it at the 375 price and see how we go as far as uh, if we get any interest, any showings, any offers. Okay. Is that where you want to begin? Sure. Now you were being pretty nice. You didn't push back on me. Did I put any fingerprints on that? No. <laughs> so when someone asks you your opinion on value, and I'm going to go through what I did, it's very germane. I'm glad we're talking about this. Is that you know, the seller?
the about the CMA rut. This is how one of the reasons why, probably not the only reason why the other agents didn't get no. So so what's interesting is that okay, so you're uh, breaking oh, up, oh, Denny. Am I breaking up? You are. The bottom. Everybody, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you now. Fine. All right. I had a bad connection there. I'm sorry about that. So notice I, I didn't I didn't give in. And when somebody asks you about what you think, and hey, that's why you're the expert. Somebody repeat repeat back to me when they want you to be the expert, what's your answer? Ooh. What are we expert on? The, the past, present, or the past, or the future. The past. Yeah, we yeah we can look at past sales, and we can we can say this is what the market's kind of doing now, as far as it's it's pretty hot, it's white hot, right? However, when they ask you for a number in the future, is that something you can you can give them with some certainty? No. So, for example, James, now's the time we got more people on. You were having a conversation with your team leader about he was getting ready to list a house, kind of set that scenario up, and then and you gave him the right answer. So walk, walk the rest of us through that conversation, James. Well, the homes here are selling, you know, so high above even what people are listing at when they think they're being excessive. We, we, we just had a home that was uh, listed you know, 50,000 of what the comps should have gone for, and it, it sold for another 30 over that. So it's a crazy market, but Andrew has a, a $3.9 million house that he's getting ready to put on the market, and he's thinking, you know, he's way up over the market. And I said, well, until you put it on the market, you're not going to know whether you're at the market or not. It's going to be one of three outcomes once you put it on the market. So that's all you can do is pick a price, and, and the market will tell you, and if the market says no, you have to adjust. Right. So the moral of the story is this, and, and it might 6% factor might be a great factor in North Carolina or whatever. However, what's interesting about this scenario, this is the same agent, and he's very experienced, 20 plus years doing multi, multi-million dollars worth of business. The market is so outrageous. This is, we, and I shared this on this call maybe a month ago, this, he went in on a listing presentation, past sales suggested he should sell, they, they, they should sell it at 2 million. He added a fudge factor of about 10% and said, well, maybe we can list it at 2.1, 2.2. The seller said, no, I want 2.5. And so he did the right, he, well, he did one more thing. He said, well, why don't we get an appraiser, appraisal on it? Now again, he was attempting to help demonstrate where Okay, so he was attempting to predict the future. And in this market, I don't think anyone can. And if you remember the story, what happened was that the appraisal came in at 2.3, even higher than his, his fudge factor on the $2 million. However, the seller held firm. We want 2.5. Uh, he did the right thing by taking the listing and it sold for 2.5. And what's interesting about this, the market is continually shocking us. Let me go back to and finish this example, and we'll talk about something else here in just a second, because this is very germane to what we're doing in, in the market on a daily basis. So, ah, okay, so now, because I stopped this, let's see if I can get, make it go again. There's the pendings. Okay, so when you look now at the pending dates, okay, now this is, I've sorted it by pending date, and I, it's not sorted by square footage anymore. Now you can see there's a 239, a 212, and a 1300 square foot range. Then look at the 264, and it's only 1500 square feet. 
Notice that is a, another data point. And so now I'm going to ask you guys, as you look at this, you're having a conversation with the seller. I know you haven't seen the home. The home has been redone. It's nice. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, the 269 basically was a bigger home, you see, three bedroom, and it was on a lake. So it had a little bit more of, um, you know, appeal. As you look at that, and again, you've not seen the home, but just look at that piece of paper. What's your gut level say from a pricing standpoint that, that you would recommend? Well, I, I'm not trying to trick you here because I know we don't recommend prices, but if you were, we were sitting around having a, a beer or something talking about what that should sell for amongst mm -hmm. ourselves, where do you think that should be priced? No right or wrong answer. I just, I just want to know your thinking. Denny, do you want to uh, screen share that with us? Oh, you're not seeing it? So evidently you're not seeing it, right? No, not yet. Okay, that's the connection. Thanks, Lori, for the tip. No, that's great. Okay, no problem. All right, here we go. Screen share. Thank you for that, Jeff. And here's the, here's the, here it is right here. Can you see that? Got it. You see, you got 264, 212, 239, all pending in March, last month. Anyone want to take a wild guess, guess at what's going through your head on how you would position that home? Remember, we're talking about the, um, the CMA rut. What else would you like to know? What questions would be going through your mind? Anybody brave? Some was of them the look like they, uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, Christina. I was just saying it was upgraded or, or any new features to the house that made a difference in those. Yeah, the, the, the subject property is upgraded. And, you know, you can put a new roof. And all, it looks, it's all been redone. It looks nice. Still, there's no, there's no, here, here's the thing, you guys. There's no past data point. If, if this were a traditional market, this is clearly looking at something under 250, correct? Uh, correct. If you took the averages, yeah, but I mean, if the market is as tight there as it is here, then you don't know where the top could be. Well, that is exactly true for sure. So going back, even Christine, when we were doing, when we were doing our role play, I would have brought this sheet out. So again, if you've not, I actually did this drawing for the seller right there and they were a little bit, it's kind of weird. There's no furniture in the home. It's all been moved out and we're standing at the counter and they, they were a little bit concerned about distance and social distancing. So it was a little bit awkward, everyone being kind of far apart. However, I, I drew this drawing for them. And again, green, the green line is the top market value. And going back to the conversation, the role play we were playing is Christine was the seller. She was throwing out numbers, 375, 425. I wasn't biting. So basically the, the decision a seller has to make is if you're gonna to miss top dollar, do you wanna miss it above or below? And so because we don't know where the market is, what I did is I, I, I thought about, obviously what, we, what, we, what we've been talking about is we wanna lead the market. The question is how far do you wanna lead it? And I believe in price point pricing, not square foot pricing. So when you look at the comparables in the 1300 square foot range, past sales, uh, houses weren't quite as nice where, you know, maybe as, maybe as much as 222 30. Uh, and then we had the most recent pending at, at just a little bit bigger at 270, 269, right? So obviously I know it's going to be out there somewhere. And as I found out later, both agents came in there and said, probably 240, 250. They, in my opinion, were evaluating the CMA as if we were in a normal market. Now I don't bid on listings and I don't say what sales prices are. However, there's two critical pieces of information that I shared and I think it's the next slide. Be the expert. Now, how do you do that? Well, it didn't take me long to know 
that, that when I did a, a search of this farm area, this listing's in our farm, there's 5,000 homes in our farm. We talk about question-based scripts. I asked the seller, hey, listen, do you, have, you know, well, there's 5,000 homes here in this area and he's lived here five or six years. So he knows how big we are. I said, do you have any idea how many homes are for sale right now? Now I know it's a tough, I, there's probably agents out there that don't know that. There might be agents on my, my team that don't know that. However, is that an important factor? Yes, it is. And if you can basically, and I'm not looking at notes, I just can remember this because I did a look up this morning. There's 37 homes for sale. Now, normally you should have anywhere from a, well, in a normal market, we would have about eight to 10% homes available at any particular time, right? And we have 37, we have 37 homes for sale. And, and here's the kicker too. And by the way, Mr. Seller, there's only one home for sale under $300,000. So when you go back to this, here's the comparables, you guys, on the pricing chart, 212, 240, and the pending at 265, roughly. Where do you think you would position that home? Those, are, uh, uh, you know, the 265 is the most recent. It was, had, it was on the lake and had an extra bedroom. So who would like to role play that with me and I'll be this, uh, I'll, I'll be the, I can be the seller or, or the agent either way. However, I'll, I'd like to have you take it as the agent standpoint. Anyone want to do that? Jeff, you feel like doing that? All right, I'm in. What do you want? You're, you pick the character. Um, I'll be the, I'll be the uh, agent. Awesome. So what do you think I should listen to that, Jeff? Well, Denny, based on the information I've shared with you, where do you feel comfortable on the price point? Well, you know, um, I don't want it to sit on the market. I don't, you know, I, I, this would be vacant and uh, I don't, I don't want to give it away and I don't want to sit on the market for six months. So with that in mind, um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not greedy. What do you think? Well, I think if we look at, you know, in this current market, um, very difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen. But if we look at what's currently available uh, in your neighborhood, along with some surrounding areas and, and neighborhoods that people would be looking at similar properties, there are only there's only one in your neighborhood and there's only three um, in the surrounding area. So based on that information and wanting to move quickly, um, you know, your house is a little smaller uh, than the one that's pending at 265 and it's not on the lake. Um, you know, the last one sold no problem for 240. Do you feel like somewhere between 240 and 265 would be the right number for you? Well, I'll probably, I, you know, I mean, somewhere in there, I'd probably be happy. I mean, that's okay. probably, you know, it's more than I could have gotten a year ago, probably. So, I mean, like I said, I, I'm not attempting to be greedy. All right. My perfect. My next question to you, Denny, is um, you had mentioned you don't want to sit on the market for a long time because it's going to be vacant. Is it more important for you to get this done with and, and move on? Or is it more important to, you know, push, push the limit a little bit and see if we can get you a little extra cash? Well, tell me more. Well, would you like to sell quickly and get a very fair number and do really well? Or would you like to give it an opportunity maybe for a few weeks to see if the market will bring us a, a little higher price point? See, that's it. I'm going to step out a minute. You see, that's a pretty interesting question. Now, again, we've not defined quickly. However, he did say the other question was in a few weeks. Another way he could have phrased that question, well, if you could add another 10 or $20,000 in your pocket, would it be worth a week or 10 or two weeks extra? That's what he's asking. Well, yeah, I would rather have a little of the money. You know, if, you, if you're talking about a couple of weeks. So Denny, getting a little more money, um, you know, you have the time to do that. Why don't we price it? Well, Careful. Closer to your high end. What would your high end be? 
Uh, help me. I don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea how high we can stretch this market. Well, based on houses selling at, you know, the highest price point and that and your size and rang it at 240. Um, if you want to get a little more money over that, what, what would you like to see over that 240 mark? See, he's not he's not bending because he's on role play with me right now. He's not, <laughs> he's not going to do it. So what's interesting now, now I'm now I'm taking you right back to this. Think price point. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the uh, the smorgasbord. You're going to have a menu of choices. When you get to that point, why don't you give them a series of numbers and let them choose? So Jeff, I'll help you out here in just a second. So when you go back to that, listen, um, you know, uh, people shop in price points. And as I told you a second ago, there's only one home for sale in this community under $300,000. There's nothing for sale in this little enclave of homes. And the price points would be two, this is how consumers shop, 250, 275, and 300. Now I'm gonna stop for a moment. Do you guys, any pushback, any questions about basically in, in the 200, maybe 300 range, forget about the $100,000 range, that doesn't buy anything anymore. Would you not agree those are kind of maybe uh, major thresholds in a price point scenario? I would say yes. And my maybe a little bit of my confusion on this is your 265 is a three bedroom. So that makes a huge difference in my market, you know, a two bedroom versus a three bedroom. So that's where that, that to me, that's a little bit of an outlier, even though there is nothing else available in that price point. So it, it does, it makes it a little tougher, I think, because I'm, I, I think in my mind, I'm thinking of that as a three bedroom, not a two bedroom. So, now you heard what he had to say. I'm just going to say, be careful. That is what I call it, the CMA rut. When you are talking about how you experience things, how you used to experience things, and a, th a three bedroom is worth a whole lot more than a two bedroom. Yeah, but do we know what that number is in this market, you guys? How many times are we being surprised at what the market will do? We are in an irrational market. The demand is real. I've said this before. However, it's not sustainable. So you may be right in, from a historical perspective, and I'll, I'll let you know what happens with this house as we go. So if, if you said 250, 275, and 300, do you believe those, forget about the bedrooms just for a second, do you believe those are price points? Now, I'll, I'll shut up first because, uh, Kevin, you don't even have homes in that price range. For those that have homes available under $300,000, or do you think those are major price points? You can chat, you can say something. Is there anybody there? Yes. So when you, so if you're at 400, you probably don't have the 25s anymore. And again, on the internet searches, most of them don't have, I'm looking from 375 to 400 or so, they're generally on the 50s. So the higher up you go, maybe you're in a $400,000 price range, four, 450, five, maybe. If you're in a seven figure price range, you, it's probably 100,000 or maybe 250,000. You, you, you gotta be between a million and 1.25. There, there, are, there are price points in every segment of the market. I don't know what yours are. However, if, when you ask the seller that, reverse roles here for a second, Jeff, and be that seller for a moment, 250, 275 or 300, is if you wanna stretch the market, if you had a magic wand, which one do you think would be somewhat realistic and be awesome if, if the market would come up to that? Well, I, I think 250 would be hopefully a given with no inventory, but uh, 275 would be amazing. Is it possible we, we can ask a series of questions to lead them where we think they should be? It's listed at 275. Do I have any data to support it? That would be a big fat no. Well, that's a little music, right? <laughs> there was an answer to your question. <laughs> so let's just stop before I go on to the next point and we'll do a couple of role plays is that 
when I'm meeting with sellers, I did not sell, say I was going to sell. You already know there's three outcomes. I, I purpose, and here's the, here's the other thing I'm going to share with you. The other two agents went in there and did the CMA and looked at it like it was a normal market. Now, I don't think that's the only reason. Obviously, it, you know, they said 240, 250, and, and, and even 250 was scaring them. I totally get that men's, uh, mindset, you guys. However, do you think if you car carried on a listing presentation and you had no DNA, no fingerprints on the numbers, only say, look, there may be a big fish out in that, just cast out there, and you know what? And he was concerned. Well, I don't know. That sounds like unbelievable. I said, I know. I've seen unbelievable things happen. I'll give him an example. Yeah, we had a house the other day or a week ago, 32 showings, two days, 10 offers, five over asking price. We have no inventory. <clears throat> Do you think that might help you win a listing? Now notice I said win the listing, I didn't say buy the listing. So I'll stop and shut up and you guys talk a little bit. What do you think about that? What would that look like in your market on a listing presentation? Any chat there, Sunny? Is anybody home? No chat. Kevin, how's, or Jeff, how's it hit you? Well, I mean, I, I think, um, I think in theory, it's 100% correct. I find in my, well, and I'm using my own experience in my price point, I feel like what we're typically seeing and I'm in the, my price point is like that $500,000 townhouse. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what we're seeing over and over again is if you fully renovate the house and you've got high retail and it looks beautiful and it's modern, what everybody wants, um, we're, we're getting higher price points consistently over and over again. If it's in a great school district on top of that, um, people are bidding and, and, you know, and, and we're not sure what's going to happen, but we're seeing a trend over and over where we're, you know, they're, they're fairly consistent. And if it's not fully renovated, um, and you try to push the market a little bit, um, they're sitting a, just a little bit longer and typically we're seeing price drops. Um, so it, as hot as the market is, I mean, in the area that I'm experiencing, I'm not really seeing anybody go crazy on a townhouse. Um, you know, we're not seeing any, you know, we're not hearing a lot of stories of something that went 50 or hundred grand over in that price point, um, unless it's, that one-off individual. Um, but again, that's just right in my kind of immediate market. Well, I think that's, I think that's a good thing because I think on these offers, these, these homes that have all these offers are crazy and in California going 300 to $400,000 over asking price and they have 19 different offers. I think listing agents are making the market crazy in many cases. Now, when, in your example, there, Jeff, where you're having, you know, the data points, you might be pushing it a little bit. You're not getting like uh, crazy offers, crazy prices over asking. I think that's a compliment to the listing agents that are listing. They're not listing uber low. So anyway, I will let you know what happens. We are taking the price point at 275. And, you know, I actually had my daughter. She didn't, she didn't see the home. And she did her own research and she would have probably said 265. I, I totally get that. I'm just going up to the next price point because you know, the one of three things will happen, he initial the sheet and we'll find out if we're right or not. So that's that. Let me move on here just for a little bit. And see we have if I one can... that's um, from Rosie. We listed $69,000 above market price and appraised price. It sold in one week with waived appraisal and as is no repairs. Right. And where was that? What market? Scottsdale. Yep. All right. So let me give you three things that uh, three things you should uh, always make your buyers aware of, and get out your question thinking hat because here's Jeff. We're going to want to come up with some questions. So. I think there's three things you should make sure your buyers understand. Now, listen, I know that this is kind of, we're in a different period of time right now. I know, go back over the last 25 years, you talk to the buyer, you want a buyer consultation meeting in, in the office and go through how we do things, blah, blah, blah. Well, this market's moving so fast. You might be having this conversation at the open house. 
you might have had a call in and now you're going actually on your way to drive to meet them, to show them the home, et cetera. However, I think there's three important ingredients that we should be able to convey to the buyer to help us become more successful. And here's, let me just say it this way, how you can win as the buyer's agent in a multiple offer market, even if your buyer doesn't. Number one, this is one thing that I think we have to do a good job of making them understand. Forget about how you bought your last home. Is there an amen out there? Amen. Now, what do I mean when I say it's, it's not a tennis match as it, it once used to be? What do you think people think of, Jeff, when I say that's not a tennis match? You know, you offer, you offer low and wait to see if they come back a little higher and you negotiate. And then the same thing happens on the home inspection. Yeah, I mean, so you're right. And it, you know, offer, counter off, blah, blah, blah. It takes four or five days, seven days or whatever. It's not like that. So here's what I want you to make note of. Help them understand we're not in a tennis match uh, market anymore. We're not in Kansas anymore. It's more like a sealed bid auction. And we only have one opportunity because, you know, m many times if we're not even the best offer, we may never hear from the seller. So if that is point number one, who would like to, and I got some experienced people there, you know, Jeff, you've been participating a lot. I got James out there. How would you handle that? If I am a buyer, how would you handle that to educate me without telling me, how would you ask me questions about that? Long time, long time people on this call will remember one question we use all the time to basically take the temperature of a buyer or seller. So I'll just give you a little bit of a hint. Would somebody like to be a buyer's agent? I'll be the potential buyer. How would you, through questions, help me self-discover what we just talked about? Are we looking at a specific property? Have we already found a house that you like, or are we just having an initial consult? Well, let's say you just showed it to me, uh, Christina, and uh, we like the house. And like, well, this sounds, this is pretty cool. This might work. Okay, well, on a scale of one to 10, uh, by one being you don't like the house at all, and 10 being how much you love the house, where would you say you feel about this particular house? Mm, what do you think, honey? About eight and a half. Well, that's pretty good. So then that means it checks most of your boxes, correct? Yep. And we know because we've been hunting that there's really very little out there right now for you guys that uh, might check all of those boxes in your price range. Is that also correct? Now, okay. Now you cheated a little bit there. You tied it <laughs> down, but that was a statement, not a question. Well, okay. <laughs> How much else out there have we seen lately that might check all your boxes? Well, we've only seen three houses and there's only three houses in our price range in the neighborhood we want to be in. This one checks the most. Okay, so then this is the one you're most excited about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you had to buy this house today, like this is the absolute one you want, what would be your top number? All right, so may I just, there's, I, I, I'm probably getting a little ahead of you. However, what do you really want to ask me? What, what, what's going through your mind as an agent right now? How much are you willing to pay for this house so that you can own it? Yes, however, there's a question that could be a, an appropriate question just before that question. If you... If you lost this house, how would you feel? Yes, okay, I get it. You, you're biting, you're, you're eating the Oreo center, you're not eating the, the cracker, okay? So what is one question? What, what is one thing we can be better at when we're working with buyers in this situation or even sellers and most agents miss it totally? It starts with the letter C. You see yourself living here? Okay. There you go. Isn't, isn't the, there's a lot of ways to ask it and you were asking it in different ways. And well, here's, here's the thing that I, I do. You, all right, so I would say, all right, so this checks all your boxes, you're there. Do you want to own this home? 
Now that is kind of a little bit more direct than what you were doing. And notice I didn't say make an offer. Will you, if you do that, you go home and wash your mouth out with soap. So, okay, so I'm gonna go back to you, Christina. You asked me, yes, yes, we do. We wanna own this home. Now going back to point one, which is that in these points, how do you, how do you prepare me now for the next move? Well, you're probably going to like this because I picked this up in one of your prior, uh, what do we call these, Zoom meetings. Uh, I basically say to my buyers that you're talking uh, to me. the market you're is talking really hot. I'm sorry, what? You're talking to me. I'm uh, the buyer. I, uh, the market is really hot right now. And you know that based on the fact that we already made an offer on another house and we didn't get that one. Uh, so basically what I want to ask you is if you were standing in the grocery store and you were at the checkout counter and there was a person in line in front of you and they were chatting with the cashier and they said, oh my gosh, I just bought this beautiful new house and your ears perk up because you realize they're talking about the house we're standing in right now. And they tell them, and I got it for a thousand dollars more than what your top number was. Are you standing there saying to yourself, gosh, I'd have paid that extra thousand dollars to own that home? Or are you okay with it because you say to yourself, well, I know I offered my best number and it's okay with me that I lost the home because that was the absolute most that I could offer them. So now I want to ask you, Denny, what is your top number? How'd you do guys? I mean, awesome. I think she did good. Awesome. I mean, she actually, she, you, you went a couple of chapters forward. However, there's nothing wrong with the way you just did that. Uh, well, the list price is, uh, the list price is 700. So, well, I mean, full price. I mean, how could I, how could I go wrong at full price? I can't make the seller upset, right? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I work with a lot of buyers. Uh, you're just one of my, my lovely clients. And I've made a lot of offers lately. And I can tell you that we've been going significantly over asking on most properties. And we have not been winning the bid. So, so all right. Uh, hang on. You are so brave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a, you're on my Christmas card list. <laughs> What am I going to say to her, you guys? Jeff, what am I going to say? But I don't want to overpay for the property. <laughs> yeah, well, I get that. However, was she asking or telling? I'm Has telling she... again. Yeah, you know, I like telling. stories. I like to do stories. I like to tell you what my experience is so that you get kind of an idea of what is going on in my industry as well. Well, that's fine. Stories are awesome. And there's, again, that there's... If you like stories and they're working for you, that's that. Here's what I want you to remember, though. When you ask a great question and you make them process, their inner voice is speaking to them, which is much more powerful than our voice. So, again, if you like stories, that's great, and it works for you. However, in this class, because this is a question-based script class, how would you ask the question? How would you help me understand that with a question? Anyway, so you, so you went full price and we still we still lost the house. Would you say to yourself, I could have offered more than full price? Uh well, I mean, uh, yeah, we're we're qualified to do whatever you know, it's gonna be cash, so it's not like we, we have a limit. I just thought that was a neighborly thing to do. Just you know, they're asking 700. Let's give them 700. Diddy, Rick Henderson said, do you think the market is working for you or against you? Would be Rick. his question. Rick, you can't talk? Are you been muted? <laughs> Have you been muzzled? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sonny, let Rick talk. He's Let anyone talk. Unmute yeah. them all. Said, nobody's on mute. Yeah, she did. No, she did. No, she didn't. Mu she didn't muzzle me. That, that you know, the meat thermometer question was the first thing that popped in my head because we do want to stay with the questions and give okay. them time, give them time. So, for the folks here, then Rick, then that's a great way to do it. So, what is that? Ask that question again, Rick. Do you think the market is working for you or against you? 
Uh, I think it's a pain in the butt, really. You know, it's uh, we're we're seeing houses are going very quickly, and it's not a lot of fun. So I think it's working against me, Rick. Okay, so when you when you're thinking about this house that you have have said that uh, checks most of the boxes for, for you, um, what if you think the market is working against you? Um, how do you feel you should position yourself for this house? Um, well, I'll give you guys a hint. Okay, there's look at look at the screen. There's three points there. You have to, you're gonna, and I know you're doing this, so I, I, I just think, well, that's what I thought. You know, normally I would never offer full price, Rick. However, in this market, I, I think that's fair. Well, I I agree that that um, that it's it's fair to offer full price, but in in this particular, you just said that the market was working. You felt like the market was working against you, um, so. In, in so what tell me what that what that is what does that look like for you i mean when you say the market's working against you how, how, how what does that mean for you well homes are going fast i mean they're on the market and they're gone so this one just came on and i'm glad you called me and we went oh, we want to buy the home so i'm ready to write an offer full price all right so on so on, on the full price uh, um you know that's that's a, that's a good that's a good starting point that's a good starting point on this. But in this in this particular one, since you know the homes are going quickly, um, you would you think there maybe there's some competition out there for the houses? So now now he's starting to go into it. Okay, now that's that. All right. So now you, I like I like the highway you're on. Well, it must be. You know, I guess that's why they call it a seller's market. There's more buyers than sellers, right? Well. So it's a it's a it's a very it's a very strong market, and so if if you feel there's a lot of competition, would it be in your best interest to uh, outdo your competitors? Oh uh, yeah, but I have no idea what they're doing. I mean, it's, I'm going in asking price, right? And um, and if the seller, I mean, if the seller has other offers, they can always, you know, if they want more, they can counter it. I guess, right? Well, in this particular market, it's not, it's not like it has been in years past. Um, there's not a lot of counter offers. Uh, that's, that's not really not, it's, it's, it's generally you're, you're one and done. And so if you, um, I tell uh, my, my buyers that they need to, if they, this house checks all the boxes for you um, to really seriously consider, um, go big and do the, make the best offer you possibly can and, and not worry about whether or not it's the, it's the asking price. But to make the very position yourself with the very best offer you possibly can. So, all right. So let me just. That's all good. Very conversational. The way I would go. So let me ask you, Rick. How did you buy your last house? How long ago was what? it? That was twenty years ago. And did you use the? What we we call it a tennis match. You made an offer, and maybe the seller countered or whatever, and you negotiated something, and there you had it, right? Yes. Based on what you just said, the market's not working in your favor. Do you know that that's not how the market works now? Are you aware of that? Well, no. I, I just thought that we, you know, we'd put an offer in, and we'd, uh, you know, the seller would respond as to. What the, what terms are we really, really looking for? And it's just kind of a shot in the dark on our part. And then we come back and we you know we sit around the table and talk about it. Yeah, I get it. I, however, that's from a historical perspective. However, you know, have you ever heard of the term a sealed bid auction, where, where basically you have to fill out a form and you got you give your bid? Have you heard of something like that? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of what we're in right now. Where if you're looking at the home, you already said you got a lot of competition. We're going to have one opportunity that you just said that, Rick. So the one thing that's different about the market we're in now versus the market you, you bought 20 years ago is the asking price is called the starting line. So my question is, and this goes back to Christina, she went right to the heart of the matter. 
if you like this home and it's checking your boxes, do you think there's other people that like it as well? Oh, I'm sure. And have you heard that many homes are selling above the starting line price? Yes, I have heard that. And by the way, do you know why homes are selling above starting line price? Mm, no. Because the, the market value is greater than the asking price. Now I'm gonna stop for a moment and I have just started inserting that into my conversation because in some people's mind, they think the asking price is the market value and people are overpaying. You see where I'm going? Yes. So my question is, are you willing to, do you wanna pay the, you wanna offer the asking price and lose the home or pay the market price and own the home? That's a question worth writing down, you guys. You see how I'm doing this? And then the question, what will be the next question somebody's going to have, Jeff? If, I, if you get to that point, what are they going to say? Well, what's the market price? There you go. We don't know. It's like you ever watch that poker on TV. There's people sitting around. And they've, got, they've got their intentions in their hands. We don't know what their, what their intention is. And the market price is whatever the buyer's willing to pay. So let me ask you, and this goes back to Christina's method. What's the most you're willing to invest to own the home? Jeff? You know, um, I mean, it's priced at 450. It's we're, seven. It's 700. Okay. It's 700. We're, we're qualified up to 780. Um, I mean, uh, do you think 750 would get it for us? Well, I mean, well, what we, what you have to do, I mean, you want my advice, or you want my advice, don't you? I do. We have one shot. I don't know what that number is. So is 750 your top number? Um, I mean, that's what I'd like to get it for, but I, I you know, uh, I really don't want to lose this house to any. My wife loves it. So um, um, do you think there'd be any issue with getting it for 780 with appraisal and everything? Well, whatever we do, because the market's moving up so fast, if you, if you want to keep your offer subject to appraised value instead of market value, you have a good chance of losing. Is that what you want to do? Yeah. No, I think the lender said we were good up to 780 and appraisal didn't really matter with our down payment. So, um, you know, I I don't want to walk you through the uh, the um, you're going to bump me a thousand and take ten minutes doing that. So let's just go seven eighty. And that's your best, right? That is one hundred percent my best. That's what I'm approved for. That's I'm putting all the money, everything, and robbing a little bit from Peter to pay Paul. So all right. So if you find out it's sold for seven eighty one, you're okay. You can sleep, right? Now, Christine, we go. Now, I love the way you modified the, the grocery store script. What's the last? We'll close this here, and then I'll give you the other two points we can talk about them next week. What is the close on that then? There's, it's the grocery store script, a little bit different than what Christine gave. Christine used it in a different way, which is very effective. Anybody know what it is? Yeah, yeah it's the one about where if you found out that you know, you, you, um, so let's say you got the house now in the future, you're in the grocery store and you find out that the, you overhear the seller talking and they said, you know, they only had a couple offers on the house and actually, uh, most of them were, you know, under 750, but one offer came in at 780 and uh, it was crazy. It was so much over everybody else. We just had to jump on it. And the question is what? How would you feel if you heard them, if you found out that you had paid a lot more than anybody else offered? So how many of you guys would actually have asked your buyer that question? Anybody, anybody want to push back on that? I like to cover all the bases. So I, I would say, well, Jeff, we got the house. I'm happy. Or I'd say, well, I wouldn't be happy about that. Then what would you say? then it sounds like this is not the right house for you and you're not ready to go all in. 
Well, that's a big leap. I would probably say that, well, then you want to, you haven't made the offer yet. Do you want to make it for a lower number? And you got to, you got to walk him back up then. You see, the bottom line is don't put your fingerprints on the price. So uh, I'm going to give you the other two points before I lose you. Number two, it's not about uh, you. It's about winning the bid. Notice I keep saying the bid, the bid, because it basically is an auction. Here's my points. Ego is expensive. Why is ego expensive? Because if they miss this house, the way the market's going, it may be a week or two or a month or two, maybe before the other one comes on, and it'll be more money. Also, when you are considering and talking and counseling your buyers, get this, this is a mindset issue. It's not about structuring an offer to meet the buyer's needs. It's about what? Meeting or exceeding the seller's needs. So it's not about them. Does it sound fair? Absolutely not. And, and basically the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules. I don't think that really applies in this market. It's basically, you know, sellers are basically in total power of it. And you know what? If you want your buyers to win, make sure they're thinking like the seller. And the number three thing that you want to get across is this. And this is interesting. Experience matters. This is a conversation you want to have with agents that want to work with, a I mean, buyers that want to work with a listing agent, or they want to basically use their brother-in-law, or they, they're not loyal to any agent. Listen. In a normal market, it's kind of like when the plane took off from D.C. How about that, Jeff? And uh, landed, Scully landed on the, uh, on the Potomac, I guess it was, right? In good weather, in a normal, in normal environment, a rookie pilot will work. Get birds in the engine, you need an agent with experience. And the, here's the acid test. How do you know you have a great agent? I call it their level of obedience. Show me an agent that's obedient to working with the buyer in the terms they want to be worked with. I'll show you a good agent, not a great agent. I don't want the doctor to work with me and follow my advice, particularly if I'm in a critical situation. Does that make sense? A great agent will help them win. A great agent will get them healed because we will tell them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. So don't be shy, you guys. We can be respectful. We can be professional. We can be totally focused on them. However, it's not about the buyer in this market. So those are the three points I think you sh should do your best to get across with the buyers you're working with. So I know we're probably at the top of the hour, a little bit past. So Jeff, well, maybe you can get some ahas from folks and you can put them in a the chat or um, let's know what's going on in your brain. Kenny? Yeah. Hey, Mark. But, you know, it's sort of like when you when you talk about is the market working in your favor or, or not in your favor? Hey, Kevin, could you uh, mute if you can hear me? Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. So the, the, the question is, do you anticipate there's going to be a large increase in inventory in the next year? And builders apparently are not going to be able to fill that. So wouldn't you rather get something now than wait a year to build something? Awesome question. Creates urgency. Nice. In the in the chat, Denny Ginger said, you know, she hasn't done it yet, but she thinks it's a great way to solidify the wants and needs. Uh, Rick said, awesome. And then to buyers, you got to think like a seller, uh, which is a great point. And uh, Reagan said, loved helping the buyer to step back and make sure they do not regret the price point they choose. Um, and Denny, I wanted to add one thing. Um, I've had some really good success with some buyers in competitive situations. Um, my first conversation that I enjoy with them is, do you have any friends um, that have been out looking for houses and had to offer multiple times? And when they start thinking about what their friends have gone through and maybe still haven't bought a house, um, it helps when you start having that conversation about, do you want to compete or do you want to win? Do you want to own it? Yeah. Are you going to keep making offers? Do you want to own? It's awesome. It's awesome, Jeff. Anything else before we go, you guys? I appreciate Jeff co-hosting. Sonny, thank you. You guys popping on. James, Christina, Mark, uh, Kevin, the rest of you guys. Uh, Ginger, good to see you again. I'll see you next week.
Same time, same bat channel. Be careful out there. Love you. Thank you, it. Denny. Thanks, Thanks Danny. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks Danny. Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Nice job, boy.